welcome you to this talk, uh, which is uh, uh, sponsored by the Tocqueville Program and the Center for American Politics and the Workshop on American Government in our Department of Political Science. I'm very pleased to see all of you, and thank you for, for being with us uh, this afternoon. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker, who is Jeff Kaba Service. Uh, Jeff is the uh, uh, a consummate Ivy Leaguer. He studied at Yale and he taught at Yale before becoming the author of The Rule and Ruin, The Downfall of Moderation and the Destruction of the Republican Party. He taught history at Yale and now he's a frequent commentator on radio and television and works in politics in Washington, D.C. You may have seen uh, Jeff uh, on one occasion, I think, on uh, Farid Zakaria's GPS, where he appears and other outlets in D.C. Uh, I asked Jeff when I uh, invited him to um, uh, Bloomington to talk about the topic that is close to my heart and uh, brought us together, and that is moderation and the Republican Party. So the talk at uh, noon today is entitled Trump and the Republican Party Crack Up, a Moderate Historical Perspective. At 4 to 5.30, um, um, Jeff will be joined by Lee Hamilton and Les Lenkowski and on a roundtable on uh, if, uh, if is there a role for moderation in America's polarized politics, which will be moderated by Professor Carmines? This will be held here uh, at 4 o'clock. Um, Jeff will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then he would, he's looking forward to taking your questions. So I hope that we'll have a spirited discussion on uh, an important topic uh, in an important season. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Cabasales. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here today. And I take it skipping out on a free lunch. Uh, that's a high compliment. I, I appreciate it. Um, I thank you very much to, to Aurelian uh, and Allison and Professor Conwines for setting this up. Thanks to David for his help with the AV material. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here at a moment when moderation seems to be needed now more than ever. Uh, and yet it's a relatively few number of us who've been studying this. So uh, thank you again, Aurelian, for bringing me here. I had never actually been to Bloomington before, uh, so this is my first time at IU. Uh, so far, so good. Um, but actually, I do owe uh, something to Indiana University, I think. Uh, as you alluded, I was at Yale as a faculty member. I was on the administration. I was there for grad school, and I was there as an undergraduate. So uh, I'm told that actually on one of my uh, uh, job applications to I apply to, the, the, the comment simply was, too male, too pale, too gale. <laughs> 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 Um, but uh, my first book was actually on Kingman Brewster, who was the president of Yale, so there was a reason for me to be at Yale all that time. Um, and one of the people who was important to him and to me was the provost of Yale in the 1960s, who was a guy called Charlie Taylor. Um, and Charlie, in turn, his mentor was a guy called Ray Hefner, who was this person here. Uh, now, I don't imagine people really remember him at this time, but he was the uh, dean of the faculties at Indiana University in uh, the 50s through the 60s, and then went on to become the president of Brown University in 1966. Um, he lasted three years in that job, and part of the reason was because he was too moderate f to enjoy it. Uh, as a university president in the 60s, you got attacked from all sides, all sides. Um, and he, he offered his resignation note suddenly in 1969 saying, I have simply come to the conclusion that I do not enjoy being a university president. Just, you know, certain amount of self-knowledge there. Uh, but anyway, Charlie studied with uh, Ray and then came here to Indiana for a decade before he went on to become president, uh, sorry, provost of Yale. And I asked him, uh, you know, what did Indiana do for you in terms of what you then came back to Yale? And said, well, first of all, the obvious thing you noticed coming from Yale was that it was co-educational, because Yale at that time was not. Uh, and there was only a handful of women who were on the faculty. And said, you know, it actually made a big difference to see women who were part of the atmosphere, students accepted alongside everyone else, and then also on the faculty as full participants. And then he also said that um, I just come to have a lot of respect for the way in which a real open society was carried forward in Indiana in the best part of the public educational tradition. It didn't really lessen my respect for the Yale tradition to focus on meritocracy, but I was surprised and pleased to discover that the brightest students in Indiana were as bright as the brightest students at Yale, um, which I thought was kind of an interesting comment there, too. So to Charlie and Ray. Um, now, I could give you a long, detailed history, which is in the book, of the modern Republican Party, but I actually really just want to sketch the outlines of the battle uh, in a way that would make sense to you so we can talk about current politics and the place of moderation there. Um, now, I actually want to start with two Democrats. Uh, why is this? Uh, because the 1960 presidential election ballot was a real historical curiosity in that three of the four people who were on it went on to become president. Um, so obviously, John F. Kennedy, 
inspiration for Barack Obama's presidency. He said that at various times. Lyndon Johnson, uh, who succeeded in the Master's assassination, was responsible for some of liberalism's greatest accomplishments and some of its greatest hubris as well. Um, and then Richard Nixon, who lost in 1960, nonetheless became president in 1968 and is still sort of an example for Republicans to both emulate and avoid for obvious reasons. But who was the fourth person on that ballot? Um, it was this person. Now, this is, a, in America at any rate, a kind of easy test of how old someone is. If you're above a certain age, you recognize him instantly. If you're beyond that and below that, you probably have no idea at all. Does anyone recognize this person? It's um, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., right. Uh, who? Um, who was actually a US senator who resigned as senator to go fight in World War II, which is kind of an unusual thing. Um, he was grandson of Henry Cabot Lodge, the senator who was the best friend of Theodore Roosevelt, who some of you may have studied at one point or another. Um, in fact, his great political antagonist in Massachusetts school's politics was James Michael Curley, who was the longtime mayor of Boston and then governor of Massachusetts. And Curley at one point filed a lawsuit against Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., claiming that he had made up his name since he wasn't really junior because he actually there was another generation between him and the grandfather. But be that as it may, I think the reason that we don't recognize Lodge is partly because he didn't become president and there's a level of obscurity that is meted out to failed vice presidential candidates no matter how famous they are at the time. It may seem hard to believe, but in 20 years young people are not going to know who Sarah Palin was. Um, but I think the other reason that he is unfamiliar to us is that the tradition of moderate republicanism that he represented uh, has more or less vanished. Um, and in fact, when I would teach students and told them that I was writing about moderate republicanism or even liberal republicanism, they would look at me as though I was making up some plot of some alternative reality science fiction novel or something like that. Uh, but the reality is that in fact, this used to be a major part of the party. Now, yes, they are few in number. And in fact, the Onion satirical newspaper uh, a few years ago proposed that since moderate Republicans were shrinking so much, they should actually be rounded up and, and put in a captive breeding program, uh, since they were losing so much territory to the more aggressive, aggressive Tea Party uh, species. And here they could actually be bred and grown up and then released into the wild once they were old enough to do so, which is amusing. But here's the only chart I'll show you. It's the reality behind this. Um, this is something the National Journal has been doing since 1982. They sort out the ideological difference between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat. And as you can see, when they started doing that in 1982, that was most of Congress. Uh, but it's been going down and down and down. 2011 in the House, those 16 members who actually occupy the middle ground, some of them are actually uh, odd outliers. One of them, for example, is Ron Paul, who's no one's idea of a moderate, but he's so far out there on the libertarian perspective that they, their sorting system confuses him as a liberal uh, in some ways. And then you can see in the Senate by 2011, there was zero uh, overlap between the most liberal Republican and the most conservative Democrat. So this is, this is polarization in a nutshell. And this is something that has come upon our political process within your lifetimes, within the lifetime of everyone here. And it's something that we don't recognize anymore because it's come upon us gradually and now we just accept it. But this is the reality of the disappearance of moderation. Um, now, the Republican Party, strange to say, used to be the more progressive party by some definitions. Even when it became known as the conservative party, it still held a lot of members who were more liberal than their Democratic counterparts. And it's responsible, even as the party of small government, for a lot of what we think of as active government achievements. So obviously Abraham Lincoln uh, freed the slaves, and the Republican Party did such active government things such as uh, driving the creation of the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, creating the land-grant colleges and universities, uh, establishing the first conservation legislation and programs, and uh, creating the national highway system. Um, and then the Democrats on the other side, even when in, we get into the 1960s, uh, they're considered to be the more liberal party, they also have the most conservative element in Congress, which is the Southern Democrats, who at that point were still supporting segregation or were very uh, reluctant to let it go. Um, and the Democrats could not really break free from that. So in 1960, John F. Kennedy soft-pedaled the issue of segregation, much more so than Richard Nixon, curiously, because Kennedy basically needed the support of the South to win, and he needed the support in Congress of the Southern Democratic chairman, uh, when the South was essentially the one-party region of the country, the solid Democratic South. 
uh, one of the advantages they had is you would pick out your candidate, Young, uh, re-elect them every time, usually without opposition, and they would gain in seniority, which means that they would get to be the head of the committees at the time when the committee system was pretty rigorously based on seniority. So even though they were a relatively small part of the country at that time, they exercised a disproportionate amount of political impact. So this was the reality in 1960, which is where I start my book here. And um, one of the things that struck me about the 60 convention was this was probably the last time when moderates were really undeniably in control of the Republican Party. Um, and depending on who you ask, uh, most political scientists, most historians will tell you there were four distinct factions in the party at that time. Um, and the person who was in charge, who was president in 1960, obviously, was Dwight Eisenhower, shown here not as president, but uh, addressing the troops before the D-Day invasion. Um, and Eisenhower was a representative moderate in many ways. He was from the Midwest, but the moderate faction was probably what we think of as, you know, the people in suits. When you watch Mad Men, these are a lot of the people you kind of figure, yeah, these are the people running the Republican Party at that time. They're Northeasterners, a lot of them, or from the bigger cities uh, around the country. And their watchwords are pragmatism and moderation and tradition and restrained government and enlightened management. Um, and they tend to be fiscal conservatives. The thing we forget about Eisenhower is that even though he was the target of conservatives who hated him more than they hated the Democrats, oddly, he was the most fiscally conservative president we've had in the last 80 years. Uh, no one has come close to his record of balancing the budget, uh, of reducing the deficit, at least as a proportion of uh, the GNP, uh, or shrinking the number of government employees from the start of his eight-year tenure to the end. Um, but Eisenhower was not uh, a, a heartless fiscal conservative in that sense. He didn't think that the balance, budget should be balanced on the backs of the poor. Um, and Eisenhower was also very prudent. That's another word we very much associate with the moderates of this period. Um, he was an internationalist. Obviously, he'd been the head of the Supreme Allied Expeditionary Forces. He had a lot of experience as a diplomat, even while he was a general. Um, but, and he believed in an active and engaged United States as the only way to prevent a recurrence of World War II. But he was not an interventionist. Uh, and in fact, you know, he resisted the counsel of the military to intervene in Vietnam to save the decaying French colonial presence there and take it over and preserve it from communism. He didn't think that was what we should be doing. It was Kennedy who sent the first uh, significant number of military advisors. Um, and again, you would say that, that the moderates were friendly to Wall Street uh, and the big corporations of the country. And that was part of how the corporations saw themselves as well. That was still when corporations felt burned by the Great Depression and the role they played in it. And you heard a lot about corporate social responsibility. Uh, and indeed, corporations would do what was called giving to the limit, which is giving right up to the limit of what they were legally allowed to contribute to philanthropy. Um, this is uh, the head of another of the sections again, kind of probably not known so well, but this is Robert Taft, Jr. And he was the son of William Howard Taft, president and the senator from Ohio. And he was representative of a faction that was probably the biggest faction in the party at that time. These people from the Midwest, the historic home of the Republican Party. Um, and small towns and small business and Main Street, much more than Wall Street or big business. Um, and traditionalist in many ways. Um, but the interesting thing about Taft was that he was not an ideological conservative, even though he was called Mr. Republican and Mr. Conservative. Um, essentially, he would look at each issue as it came up. And rather than looking at polls or consulting conservative ideological tablet keepers, he would just decide what he thought about this issue from the ground up. And this meant that sometimes he actually reversed himself in sort of spectacular ways for the period politics of the time. So for example, he believed very deeply that every American child needed an equal opportunity uh, to get ahead in life. And he eventually concluded that that meant that the government had to support public education, which he'd always resisted, and government had to support uh, public housing, which he'd also resisted. Um, and the thing about Taft, again, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get too involved in the politics. I'm trying to approach this more as a historian, but histori the Republican Party's had a reputation as the stupid party, much as the Tory party in Britain had the reputation as the stupid party. The quote actually comes from Benjamin Disraeli. Um, but no one ever said that about Taft. Um, his wife was actually at a public rally and was asked whether her husband was a common man. It's always a good thing in American politics to stand with the common man. And she said, oh, no, he's not a common man at all. He was first in his class at Yale and first in his class at Harvard Law. 
I think it would be wrong to have a common man represent the people of Ohio. Of course, all the political professionals went white, but the crowd, the crowd clapped. Um, now, the other faction... Uh, oof, I did use this slide. Sorry, I forgot. Um, this is Nelson Rockefeller in a characteristically exuberant uh, gesture. Um, and he was the head of what was called the Progressive Faction, uh, also known as Liberal Republicans. And a lot of them were from New York, where Rockefeller himself was the governor. Um, but in general, the progressives also sort of traced the Puritan diaspora. Uh, you would find them in New England, you would find them in the upper Midwest, you would find them on the Pacific Coast, uh, both in the upper Northwest states and in California even. And these are people who very much identified with the progressive legacy of Theodore Roosevelt <coughs> uh, and his Bull Moose Party when he led them out of the Republican Party in 1912. Uh, they did believe, actually, in active government as a way of helping the average person get ahead. Um, they were probably more interested in social stability than they were in what we think of as liberalism or transforming humanity. Uh, but nonetheless, they often voted with the liberals, particularly on issues like civil rights and civil liberties, which were most important to them. Um, and then there were the conservatives. And this, oddly enough, was the smallest of the factions in 1960. Um, and the idea that this would be the group that would force all the rest of the party to dance to their tune would have been all but incomprehensible at that time. Um, and Barry Goldwater was their leader. Uh, he was the senator from Arizona who more or less seized power in 1964 uh, thanks to his grassroots activists uh, at a time when the typical machinery of the moderates especially had decayed. Uh, but these were people who were mostly from the South and West, uh, these were people who were economic, cultural, and social conservatives, um, even though Goldwater was what we would now think of as being more of a libertarian. Um, they were anti-government in theory, if not always in practice, because, of course, Arizona took massive subsidies from the federal government, particularly during the New Deal. Um, and they were militant anti-communists. In many ways, the modern conservative movement derives from Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, who inspired not just the anti-communist spirit of it, um, but also this sense that America is being betrayed from within. Um, anti-communism was generally accepted across the board by the moderate sections of both the Republicans and the Democrats, but this idea of internal betrayal was almost unique <coughs> to conservatives, and it continues to the present day, even in Donald Trump's rhetoric that the election is going to be rigged and stolen. There's always an internal enemy that needs to be confronted in conservative theology. Um, and there is essentially a, a, a call on, these, on the part of the conservatives to take a completely different approach, not to have the Republican Party continue to be what it had always been, which is a coalition of interest groups, uh, but to be essentially an ideological party, unlike any that had ever existed in the United States before. Um, but this is not quite as easy as it seems because, in fact, even the new conservative movement that comes along, beginning with McCarthy, beginning with the creation of National Review magazine in 1955, this is a coalition of conservative ideologies uh, because libertarians actually have a lot of contradictory beliefs with social conservatives. The social conservatives and the traditional conservatives have a lot of contradictory beliefs with um, the people who are militant anti-communists. Um, you cannot both have a large state and successfully prosecute the Cold War. Um, and so Bill Buckley and Frank Meyer with his doctrine of fusionism keep the conservative movement together to some extent, and they're also just together because they see the enemy as being both liberalism and, maybe even more, the moderates within their own party. So ultimately, what they would like to do is join hands with the Southern Democrats, who are the conservative people in the Democratic Party, kick out the moderates from the party, and become this ideological entity. And that is more or less what eventually would happen. Um, now, there's a term that you've probably heard, uh, rhino, Republican in name only. This is a lot of uh, things that, uh, it's, a, it's a name that the conservatives level at people who are just slightly to their left. <coughs> um, but in fact, in the long scheme of history, you could argue that it's the conservatives who are the Republicans in name only because they depart so significantly from the party's history and heritage. So for one thing, the Republican Party had been, as I said, a big tent party um, and had been a coalition, like I said, of interest groups rather than ideologies. It was fiscally conservative in a way that, curiously, uh, modern-day conservatives are not. Now, that sounds a bit odd, uh, but again, go back to Eisenhower, right? Eisenhower didn't love tax, and in fact, um, although it's Johnson who gets all the credit for the 64 tax cut, 
If you actually look at the change that Eisenhower made to deductions in 1958, that was actually larger as a percentage of the budget at that time than was Johnson's tax cut. But nonetheless, uh, Eisenhower is presented with an opportunity to cut taxes, but it's during a recession. He says, no way, uh, because that essentially is a road for, for red ink uh, and deficits. And that is what fiscal conservatism meant. Um, there was an interesting comment by John Kenneth Galbraith. I saw his face over there on a plaque. Uh, in 64, he said, you know, there actually is a bit of a danger in this tax cut that Johnson's carrying out, which is that conservatives are going to get to like uh, the delights of tax cutting too much. And what we're going to get then is kind of a, a form of reactionary Keynesianism. And in fact, a lot of today's conservatives, fiscally speaking, I think are better described as uh, reactionary Keynesians than they are as traditional fiscal conservatives. <coughs> now, something to remember about um, the, the Republican Party at this time is that a lot of the social issues that now, since Reagan's time, really have played havoc uh, with the party were not as important. Um, and so it, there was a gender gap in American politics prior to 1980, but this was a gender gap that operated in favor of the Republican Party. Women disproportionately voted Republican because they saw that as the safe, reliable party in some sense. It wasn't until social issues came into the party that this made a difference. And Reagan, um, as many people have said, you know, wouldn't have been an, an ill fit in today's party. And one of the reasons why was that he passed the nation's most liberal abortion law as California governor in 1967. But it wasn't really an issue back then. It was seen through the lens of Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, and the Republican Party was the disproportionate Protestant Party at that time. And even ev evangelicals like Jerry Falwell said, well, Catholics are against abortion. That means we Protestants are for it, because we're against whatever the Catholics are for. <laughs> so again, just a, a, a strange set of, of policies. Now, neither party was really what we would call feminist, but the Republican Party could make the better argument to being the more pro-feminist of the two parties. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith the senator from Maine was the first woman from either major party to be a presidential candidate. Um, and the Republican Party at that point was solidly behind the Equal Rights Amendment. Dwight Eisenhower, 100% for that. It wasn't until Phyllis Schlafly's conservative campaign came along that that changed. And it wasn't until 1980, I believe, that the ERA language was taken out. Um, and a funny thing about John F. Kennedy, you know, that he's considered to be the paragon of all things liberal, which is that when he came into office and started making his cabinet appointments, the number of women who'd been appointed to that level fell off a cliff. And that's because Kennedy was coming in with this new ideal of meritocracy. It's not going to be you know, the old political hacks making the appointments. But in fact, women have been equal participants in a lot of grassroots politics. And they were rewarded in the traditional manner by getting these appointments, but not under Kennedy. So the whole liberal ethos of meritocracy at that time was anti-woman because women were not considered to have merit in the same way that men did. You did not have women who were Rhodes scholars, for example. So again, a different era here. And civil rights, another part where the two party identities switched perhaps from what we think. There can be arguments about this, of course. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, a greater proportion of Republicans than Democrats in Congress voted for both the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act. And the first senator elected after Reconstruction was Edward Brooke, who was a black Republican from Massachusetts. Um, so again, the, the lines are very much more blurred here than they were later on. Um, the GOP was arguably more civil liberties than the Democrats. Uh, this used to be a very famous Republican, John Lindsay, who at the time this was taken was a member of Congress from the Silk Stocking District of New York City, uh, and then became mayor of New York City in 1965, re-elected in 69. Um, and his greatest opponent when he was a member of Congress was Robert F. Kennedy who at that time was attorney general to his brother. And Lindsay said that essentially Robert F. Kennedy protected his brother like a mafiosa don protecting the family. Um, and Robert F. Kennedy was all for wiretapping. Lindsay wasn't. And the reason that Lindsay defended his status was he said, look, this is the Republican Party's first slogan. Free speech, free press, free men, free labor. We are the party of civil liberties. The idea that the party would eventually stigmatize the ACLU as liberal and beyond the pale would have seemed incomprehensible at this time. Um, and the GOP used to seek the votes of minorities much more actively than it did, and more successfully. So Eisenhower, in 1956, uh, actually got 40% of the African-American vote. And even Nixon, in 1960, uh, got a third of the African-American vote. 
But when Barry Goldwater became the nominee in 1964 for the Republican Party, he'd been one of the very few Republicans in Congress to vote against the 64 Civil Rights Act. But by making him the nominee, that put the impress of segregation and Jim Crow on the Republican Party, despite this history going on way back to Lincoln, of being the pro-civil rights party. And again, you see support for African Americans for the GOP fall off the cliff to 4% in 64, and it's never significantly recovered. Um, and the same has been true to the great worry of those people at the RNC who follow demographics uh, with other minority groups. Uh, it did not used to be an issue for Hispanic voters. Sometimes, depending on states, they would split their votes evenly. George W. Bush got about 40% of the Hispanic vote uh, when he was governor of Texas. Uh, not anymore. And curiously, the most pro-Republican ethnicity in the United States used to be Asian Americans, as recently as the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, but increasingly, you see that they vote even in lesser proportion in GOP than Hispanics. And, although for somewhat different reasons. In this case, it seems to be because Asians don't like both the Republican attitude as a seemingly white nationalist party, and also they think that they're anti-science. So there's a lot of change, like I said, that has happened in the party here. Uh, this is a, a bit of an interesting slide from a historical perspective. Um, that person there on the left is George Romney, who used to be the Republican governor of Michigan. And the person on his right is Mitt Romney, who grew up to be the last Republican presidential nominee. Um, and George Romney was, again, a moderate. Uh, and he, in 1967, entered the race to become president uh, and curiously, instead of going overseas to do a tour with foreign dignitaries, as at that time was traditional for people, particularly who lacked foreign policy experience running for president, he actually went to the most economically deprived parts of the United States, uh, the inner city ghettos, the most deprived parts of Appalachia. And the reason was he thought these were the people who needed the Republican message the most, and also the Republican Party had always had their interests at heart. Uh, he never believed that the Republican Party was a rich person's party. And although he had once supported the Vietnam War, by 1967, he had actually turned against it. Um, and so what you could have had, again, in this alternative reality we're, we're, we're sketching out here, is where George Romney became the presidential nominee, and therefore the anti-war party was the Republican Party, because the Democrats would have voted Hubert Humphrey, who was supportive of the Vietnam War. Uh, now, of course, it turned out that the 68 winner was not Romney, but Nixon. Uh, he's the one on the left. <laughs> this is actually uh, the most uh, requested piece of media from the Nixon Library out in California, <laughs> the President and the King. Um, and you know, it's a funny thing because if Elvis, in his drugged haze, had actually pulled out the revolver that he gave to Nixon and it had been loaded, actually, which it probably was, and had shot Nixon dead, we might remember Nixon as one of the greatest liberal presidents, um, or at least moderate presidents, because he actually gave the moderates. Uh, in the party, a lot of what they've been looking for policy-wise. Um, he was balancing a person, the party. He actually took a lot of moderates into government with him. Um, and he, like I said, he passed things like uh, the opening to China, which in some ways founded our present age of globalization, uh, which was a, part, a policy they'd been pushing for a long time. Uh, decentralization and the new federalism, again, emerged from moderate Republican intellectual circles. Uh, and Nixon created, strange though it is to say, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is now such a bugbear of conservatism, and even OSHA, uh, the Safety and Health uh, Agency. So there were a lot of things that Nixon did on that side. On the other hand, he also pursued the Southern strategy and welcomed barely repentant segregationists into the Republican Party uh, to the point that Southerners took over the leadership by the 90s. That's kind of the big turning point there in terms of sectional rivalries within the party. Um, and also sort of gave it the populist flavor, which in some ways Trump is the beneficiary of. So a curious person here. But like I said, this is, again, this distant party we barely forgot about, but where deals were mostly done between moderates of both parties, rather than being trying to push by one party over the other. There was much more collaboration in Congress at that time. I'm sure Congressman Hamilton will be able to tell you about the old order such as it was at that time. Now, a lot of where even today's conservatism, even where Donald Trump comes from, goes back to 64 and the Goldwater Convention, uh, because it was there that you actually got you know, this unyielding posture towards the moderates in their own party, whom they hated more curiously than the liberals. The liberals were merely the enemy. The moderates were traitors. 
and Goldwater refused to accept help from moderates who wanted to be part of the campaign uh, and took down the Republican Party to the biggest loss it had suffered since Franklin Delano Roosevelt's era. And it wasn't just that Goldwater lost in a landslide, it was that the Republican Party was all but wiped out in Congress, in state legislatures, at sheriff's offices, I mean, you name it, it was a terrible year. And this actually did have kind of a chastening effect, I think, on the party that I can get into. Um, and one of the things about 64 was that the moderates, again, stood up against the nominee who they said did not represent the party. There are a lot of parallels you can draw between 2016 and 2000, sorry, 1964, in terms of the intra-party conflict between the relatively more moderate elements and the relative conservative elements. William Scranton, who was the governor of Pennsylvania, actually ran as a, an opposition candidate uh, in the late GOP primaries, based essentially just on his rejection of Goldwater's refusal to uphold the civil rights tradition of the Republican Party. So the tradition of a party feuding amongst itself is not new, but what worries Republican strategists is that things might go as they did in 64, which they'd rather not have happened. Um, now, you actually do get beyond to more moderate Republican presidents um, following Nixon. Uh, Gerald Ford, with the famous headline there, Ford the City Drop Dead, uh, and Ronald Reagan. Now, a lot of conservatives have objected to attempts to co-opt Ronald Reagan as a moderate. And it's true, he was not a moderate. But he was a believer in a big tent Republican Party. And what's notable about this election is this marks really the repudiation of Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of a fellow Republican. Um, Reagan insisted to the conservatives that they had to hold in their tendencies to reject help. Uh, one of his famous quotes was, you know, we don't destroy enemies, we win friends. Politics is about addition, not subtraction. Um, and so Reagan was a great person to hold the Republican coalition together, but he also set loose a dynamic that led to where we are now, where there would be an ever purer definition of ideology. And as many people have pointed out, Ronald Reagan would not meet that definition nowadays, because not only had he signed the abortion bill while he was California governor, he'd also passed the biggest tax increase in any state's history to that point. Um, he was in favor of certain kinds of gun control. <laughs> He was an active conservationist. He opposed right-to-work laws. Um, and he, he is, uh, you couldn't help but notice that his wife's best friends were all gay men. Um, so just on issue after issue, he did not hold to what is now a conservative litmus test, which is also held as being the Reagan test. Um, George H.W. Bush, <laughs> there on the left, with the Adler, who really could play guitar, um, uh, was in many ways, uh, the son of his father, who was a moderate Republican senator from Connecticut. Um, he didn't convincingly take on the Texan persona. His son did, uh, again, because I guess I'm too steeped in Yale. Um, this is actually from the Yale yearbook, George W. Bush's class of 68. It's actually captioned, uh, George W. delivers an illegal but gratifying right hook to an opponent. <laughs> um, but again, people tend to forget George W. Bush was not campaigning as a moderate, but he was campaigning as a conservative, compa uh, cons compassionate conservative. And compassionate conservatism drew in a lot of the intellectual tradition and attitudes of the moderates, even though moderates themselves were a relatively uh, shrinking part of the conservative coalition at that point, or the Republican coalition. Now, on the intellectual side, again, William F. Buckley is the godfather of intellectual conservatism, conservative movement. He's not going to be co-opted as a moderate. But um, when I was working my way through graduate school, I actually did it not by washing dishes, as I probably should have, but actually by being research assistant to Sam Tannenhouse, who is still working on his massive biography of William F. Buckley. Uh, but the upshot of this was that I spent a lot of time in Buckley's papers, and I spent a lot of time with Buckley himself. Um, and Buckley, again, knew that he had to herd a lot of quarrelsome cats uh, as head of the conservative movement, and then a lot of these elements of the, of the movement were incompatible. And so he actually took on what were in effect moderate positions vis-a-vis -vis coexistence within that coalition. Um, and I think had learned a lot, as Reagan had, from Goldwater's defeat, and knew that they had to make conservatism more appealing to a majority of the population. And there's a quote I remember from one of his letters, uh, which is funny because the person he's writing about is his son Christopher, who I now know as well. He's a successful novelist. But he said, I've recently had to negotiate with my 15-year-old son, um, regarding whom I suppose I possess weapons as definitive as any of those at the nuclearists at the Pentagon. <laughs> but I found myself not temporizing, that's the bad word, but calculating, figuring, reckoning. And I do think it's part of the conservative function to do that. And I don't think that the say-so is betrayal. And it's that element of 
calculating, figuring, reckoning conservatism that has gone by the wayside in a lot of the movement at this point. So the movement misses both Buckley and Reagan. Uh, they made a big difference in the ultimate success of the conservative movement. Now, what you also see is some things like Jack Kemp, who was the big protagonist of the supply-side economics movement. You know, Kemp was another pro-civil rights Republican. He'd been on the football, Buffalo Bills football team. You know, he'd actually showered with black people, unlike most Republican politicians at that time. He believed that supply-side economics would be of more benefit to black people in the middle, in the inner city than it would be to white suburban corporate people. Uh, he genuinely believed that. He spent most of his time talking to black audiences. Um, and I'd like to believe, having known Kemp a bit, that if he found that instead all the benefits of this doctrine were going to the top 1% of the 1%, that he would have gone back to the drawing board. Um, but again, what you see over time within the conservative movement is an ideological rigidity, a sort of calcification taking shape, um, and essentially making what had been tentative matters of doctrine into theology, which again goes against the moderate grain of things. Um, you also have a reality now in the Republican Party that the major worries that most candidates have to worry about is not uh, the general election, at least at the House level, but a challenge from the right, a primary challenge, uh, funded by outside people. And the poster girl, I guess, is Christine O'Donnell, who a few years ago ran against Mike Castle of the Republican Party. Um, and Castle was considered the issue for that election. He'd been a very popular governor of Delaware. He'd been a very popular representative. The Democrats only put up a token opponent. Uh, and the, the people who would, you know, the serious contenders stayed out. But Castle was defeated in the Republican primary by Christine O'Donnell, who was probably one of the least prepared uh, Senate candidates ever, um, having really made her name as a campaigner against um, uh, abortion and masturbation. Um, and she eventually had to deny that she was a witch. She had a very colorful history, and she lost by big margins to this Democratic candidate. But this is a problem which, of course, you saw to some extent here in Indiana with Richard Luger's loss to Richard Murdoch a few years ago, where someone who is not uh, the popular candidate comes up and can topple the Republican who's a moderate, but can't win the general election. You saw that with Todd Akin, obviously. Uh, other candidates of that sort as well. Um, Mitt Romney had uh, evidence of things. <laughs> Got to arrange your grandchildren in the right order here. Um, <laughs> uh, he had been a moderate governor of Massachusetts for the most part, and his single accomplishment was the basis for Obamacare. But he had to disavow that, as well as much else that he and his father had stood for, because you simply cannot win a primary without going to the right. And that meant that it was impossible for him to really position himself back toward the center in the general election, much as Trump has had that difficulty to the extent that he's tried at all. Um, and there's been a, an evolution, an intensification, a radicalization on the Republican side, not even always so much in terms of ideology, so much as tactics. I don't know if you recognize this person. He's well known in the Beltway, but doesn't seem to be recognized outside. Um, he's a congressman from Ohio. So in one of the ironies of our current history, he actually represents Oberlin College. <laughs> um, Jim Jordan. And he's the head of the House Freedom Caucus, which is a faction in the House that split off from the Republican Study Committee because even conservatives aren't conservative enough. But it was more than that. Uh, who is Jim Jordan's big enemy? Well, it was John Boehner. Uh, and now it's Paul Ryan. And essentially because they don't believe in any form of compromise whatsoever. Any form of compromise, working with Democrats on anything is treason. And the government ought to be shut down, in their view. And anyone who wants to try to keep it open on the Republican side is the enemy to be got rid of. And they are able to have success because unlike at any time in the past, they are voting as a block. So even though there's only 40 of them, um, this actually makes a big difference if you're Speaker of the House because you have to be elected with a majority of Congress. And that means that if the Democrats don't give you any votes, which is typical in House elections, you have to get a majority of Congress from the rest of your party, and if 40 people are holding back, boom, you don't have the majority to be reelected. So their major item of business is, after the elections, to get rid of Paul Ryan as Speaker, unless he accedes to some of their demands, which he's unlikely to do. Uh, and again, the prospect of shutting down the government uh, is not a big deal. They worked closely with Ted Cruz in 2013 when he orchestrated that shutdown. Uh, and the prospect of the United States defaulting on its debts, again, is not a matter of great concern to them. So it's funny. This is like the best of all times the Republican Party and the worst of all times. Um, electorally speaking, it's almost a golden age. Uh, the Republicans have more members in Congress than they've had since 1928. Uh, they dominate more state legislatures than they have at any time since the 1920s. 
Uh, and yet, they aren't able to get what they want um, because of, I think, the absence of moderation, because of the absence of these elements who actually were able to broker deals with the opposing party to compromise at a time when that was not a bad word. Um, and it's people like Newt Gingrich who got us into this situation um, with, again, tactical radicalism as much as ideological radicalism. And then people who, when they had hair, maybe a little less recognizable, but you know, these were Gerald Ford's main aides. Um, Cheney, on the left, and Rumsfeld, right? And again, they had reputations within the party as relative moderates. And Mitch McConnell used to be considered a moderate as well. Um, but it's the era of partisanship and polarization. Mitch McConnell saying that our major goal is to get their, you know, our major goal is to have Obama be a one-term president. That, I think, has got us into this situation. Now, I want to... Um, touch on Trump, at least. This is his portrait at Mar-a-Lago, his estate down in the Palm Palm Beach. This is how he regards himself, clearly, with the gold, with the big hands. Um, and it's right, you know, because if you told me... We don't see the right hand, however. Oh, uh, okay. So, if you told me two years ago that the next Republican presidential nominee would be a New York businessman uh, who had a history of making deals, which requires each side to give up a little something, um, I'd be, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Tell me more. Okay, well, he'll also offend against every faction of the Republican Party. Uh, he will offend libertarians with his call to rebuild the infrastructure and create new entitlement programs like daycare for women. Uh, he'll offend against uh, the social conservatives, partly through his libertine lifestyle, but also because he clearly has not cared about issues like abortion or gay marriage. Um, he'll offend against the neoconservatives. He'll be a big critic of George W. Bush's Iraq intervention. Um, and his, his slogan that he'll use is actually going to be from Ronald Reagan, one of Ronald Reagan's sort of cast-off phrases, but it'll actually nod in the direction of David Brooks's American Greatness School of Moderate Conservatism. I'd say, oh, wow, that's, that's very interesting. But it turned out to be Donald Trump. Um, and Trump is, is interesting because in the way that political scientists often make their calculations, he would be regarded as a moderate. Um, David Brookman from Stanford University, among others, has sort of written about this. Um, you know, we have this idea that someone who is a moderate is someone who takes a, a temperate position on everything. Um, but the way the political scientists usually calculate it, it's like it's the average of your position. So if you really love cats, but you really hate dogs, this averages out to you feeling moderately about pets. Right? And, and it's the same thing with Trump. Some of his positions are actually what would be considered pretty far to the left. I mean, again, he's offended the fiscal conservatives because... Uh, he believes that Social Security and Medicare need to be added to, not, not reformed or cut in any way. That would have been a heretical position, but he's able to do it because of the force of populism. But this does not make him a moderate because he is so extreme on these other areas such as immigration, xenophobia, uh, you kind of can just go down the list. Um, I want to get a little bit, just in, just in two minutes, just touch on this, to my previous book, uh, which was what partly made me so Yalish, because this was a biography mostly of uh, Kingman Brewster, who was the president of Yale University, shown here in 64, giving an honorary degree to Martin Luther King. Uh, and I probably spent more time trying to figure him out than any other person to whom I was not related or didn't know uh, personally. Um, and, you know, try to find out why did this person come to, to be a moderate. And often it's just a lot of unique factors. Um, in his case, he was the 11th generation lineal male descendant of Elder William Brewster, the spiritual head of the Mayflower. And he had that security that made him not worry too much about the things that worry less secure people in this life. Um, but he also was the product of divorce at a time when that was very unusual. His parents were nothing alike. His father was an ultra-conservative. His mother was a quasi-communist. Um, but he appreciated that clash of differences, which speaks to the eclecticism of many of the people that Aurelian writes about. They're not always one thing or the other. Um, and his mentor was Roger Baldwin, the head of the ACLU, who, although, again, the ACLU has a definite partisan uh, coloration at this point, it didn't back then. Baldwin said he was always a pragmatic. He was both a liberal conservative and a conservative liberal, and he was operating in the oldest traditions of the American Republic, going back to the Bill of Rights. Um, and Brewster was a very successful university president because uh, partly of his law school education. He was an adherent of the legal process school, which said that it doesn't really matter what your ends are so much as you follow the right means. Um, and any, any goal you set out to achieve through the right political legal procedures will ultimately be a beneficial result for the people. Uh, and he brought that approach as university president and was able to hold his university together when many were not. Um, but I also 
I, I have positive feelings toward the moderates, but I recognize some of the drawbacks, because King of Brewster's best friend was McGeorge Bundy. Um, and McGeorge Bundy was one of these people who um, almost kind of glided through life for, for much of the time. Um, his grandfather was the president of Harvard. Um, he himself, this was always kind of an interesting thing to me. Uh, you know, every year some people go on to become Supreme Court clerks. They've been the head of their law reviews, usually at the very top schools. Uh, McGeorge Bundy was offered a law school clerkship without having gone to law school at all. Um, he became the dean of Harvard without having a PhD. Um, and again, because he was part of a relatively small group of Americans who at that point controlled just about everything in society, the upper class wasps. And moderation was their byword. Uh, and in some ways, this still is what affects our discussions of moderation and why people sort of discuss it a little dismissingly sometimes. Um, Elliot Richardson, another one of the figures in my book, um, held five cabinet positions, was an impeccable public servant, um, and yet when he ran for office in Massachusetts, his opponents, opponents, mind you, printed up bumper stickers that said, vote for Elliot Richardson, he's better than you. <laughs> um, and that's because he was a Boston Brahmin, he was Harvard educated all the way through, um, he was extremely wealthy, and you know, some of the aura of privilege adhered to his moderation, much as it did to George Bundy. And so something I want to talk about, as we should get into the discussions now, is the way in which moderation in some ways is seen as, I don't know, not entirely a positive thing, even for people who are not ideologically one way or another. Uh, the word itself is it's not exactly pejorative, but maybe it's a little bit of a diminutive, you know. How was Canvas Services talk? It was moderately interesting. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I had a moderately good time. Um, you can see a lot of this, this sort of thing. Uh, it's almost a, a dismissive. In our culture, is advertising going to say, this will be a moderately good product? It's, it's extreme, radical even. It's actually a good word in the advertising buzz of things. So, you know, there was a time when Lowell Weicker, who was, again, one of these progressive Republican senators from Connecticut, was confronted with an angry constituent, said, you know, you people in Congress are all crooks and corrupt and this, that, the other thing. And he rather mildly replied, well, it is a representative form of government. Um, and, you know, the question we have is, is moderation no longer a force among us because we ourselves have ceased to be moderate, even if that's not necessarily how we think of ourselves or even how we think we vote. Um, and, you know, moderation is not just something in politics. It's something that extends beyond. And obviously, going back to Tocqueville in the back of the room, it's part of what has defined America. It's the very air we breathe. And I think we take it for granted at our peril. Um, but increasingly, what you find is not just in Congress, but even when you're thinking about the people who are voting in a different way from you, they're not just mistaken in their beliefs. They're maybe enemies. They're maybe less American than you are. And I think this is something that we need to resist. And this goes all the way back to, again, the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, and his first inaugural address. You know, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. And I think moderation is one of these mystic chords of memory that Lincoln touches upon, that I hope draw upon the better angels of our nature. You're a patient audience. Thank you. We should, uh, you should open any questions. So we should take uh, uh, questions. Um, would you like to take two questions at a time or one at a time? Because one at a time is more economical time. because then people start adding amendments and subheads. <laughs> and I'd like, like to take the privilege of uh, being the host and uh, start on a high note here with a question <laughs> about uh, the only um, um, uh, manifesto for moderation that was published uh, in the lifetime. Uh, it, was, it appeared in the Playboy magazine, if I understand correctly. <laughs> In 1970, and I'd like to ask you, what that did you research it properly? And <laughs> what did it say? Uh, it was published by Benjamin Lee Auspitz. That's what I learned from your book, and it seems to be a, a, a rigorous manifesto of moderation. Yeah, yeah. Why did he publish it in Playboy, and what did he say? <laughs> um, so Lee Auspitz, where did you do the research? <laughs> <laughs> Lee Auspitz uh, was and is a philosophy professor. Um, at that point, he was a graduate student at Harvard. And uh, he actually said, well, you know, I published it in Playboy mostly because they paid the most money. They paid like a dollar a word in those days. That was unheard of. Uh, and this was a long article. Um, but he also said, you know, that's, I, I published a lot in those days back in you know, the mainstream press. I published in the Washington Post. I published in the New York Times. But the only time that people came up to me on the street at Harvard and Cambridge to say that they read and liked something I read was when I published it in Playboy, which says a lot about what people at Cambridge really read. 
Um, yeah, this was something that came out of uh, the Ripon Society. Now, when I set out to write Rule and Ruin, I faced the problem that a lot of people face when they want to write about politics, which is that politicians' archives aren't very interesting. And this is partly because most of the really interesting stuff has been taken out. These archives have been sanitized, and also that most politicians kind of watch what they say. I mean, these are people who actually have other people write their speeches for them, right? Um, so that's why you want activists, and that's why conservatives have received so much attention from scholars in recent years, I think, to the exclusion of politics, because you can get at the conservatives' archives, and you can get them to say colorful things, and there are colorful things to be found in their archives as well. Uh, whereas the signal-to-noise signal ratio is very different when you're talking about politicians' archives. So anyway, when I was writing about modern Republicans, my go-to group was the Ripon Society. Uh, and this was, you know, it, yeah, now it's more or less forgotten. Uh, and in fact, there's only one university that actually has the complete back issues of its, uh, of, even of its publications, let alone of its papers. Um, but at the time, they were actually pretty influential. Uh, and they were sort of speaking for youth uh, and suggesting that maybe youth wasn't going to go the way of the far left, let's say. Um, and that was kind of interesting to people. And one of the things that got the Ripon Society started, curiously, was a Republican boycott of the Woolworths lunch counter. Uh, again, Republicans could be found on both sides of the civil rights demonstrations in that era. And two of uh, his friends wanted to actually have Nelson Rockefeller fund a Freedom Ride bus full of Republicans going down to the South. And if, Repu if Rockefeller had been a little more creative, I think he would have done that. But anyway, based on everything that they had sort of learned from being in the Ripon Society, they came up with moderation as more or less a third way, a, a way between extremes. Um, in fact, you could almost call moderate Republicans balanced Republicans, if that did not mean that their opponents were unbalanced Republicans, which has a different connotation. Um, but anyway, the, the oppositions they set up, the, the Republicans were neither isolationist nor interventionist. They were internationalist. Um, they were neither centralizers nor anarchists. They were decentralizers, but they wanted there to be this kind of a framework of things. And, you know, he would go, kind of go down and down this list. And it was an interesting thing, but none of his predictions really came to be because he's writing this at the tail end of the 60s, uh, when the forces that have kind of been unleashed by the changes of that era are too much to be sort of put back into a moderate package, I guess. And this is true on both the left and the right. Um, you know, one of the things we tend to forget, some scholars are now re appreciating this, is the places that the new left went with their conclusions about society, the new right went first. Uh, and I had shown a few slides back um, Big George Bundy. And in 1951, uh, William F. Buckley Jr., from another previous slide, came out with his first book, which is called God and Man at Yale. And by far the most scathing review was from Big George Bundy in the Atlantic magazine. And he called uh, Buckley a twisted and ignorant young man <laughs> whose views of economics are more primitive than Mark Hanna's. Uh, and this is an argument within the Republican Party over the definition of conservatism, because McGeorge Bundy actually created what was called the New Conservative Movement to infuse conservatism and put a moderate stamp and spin on it, I guess you'd call it. Um, and Buck, uh, Bundy was, sorry, Buck, Buckley was rather undone by this, and he wrote back a very angry response, which is that you people like uh, Bundy are in effect the establishment that I've been struggling against my entire life, that really the American people have been struggling against. You are haughty totalitarians who refuse to allow the American people to choose their own destiny. And this is exactly the same rhetoric that comes up uh, again with the new left and the way in which the moderate answer, the moderate strain, is also equated with the establishment. And, and this is something that Auspitz and his fellows could not get beyond. And so that meant that as sensible as many of his prescriptions were, it couldn't happen in politics, and the moderates really were already on the way out under the tail end of Nixon's first term. Can I, can I ask a question, sir? <clears throat> One of the things, looking forward, uh, you, 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 uh, kind of the conventional wisdom is that what happened, the reason that Goldwater was able to change the fundamental direction of the Republican Party is because the people who were brought into the party in 64 stayed. So they became the, um, you know, the carriers of this new invigorated conservative movement, 
Some of them ended up becoming part of the establishment in the Republican Party. But one question about Trump that I puzzled with is, are the, are the people that he's brought into the party this year, there, there is a new group of people that he's, that he's uh, uh, attracted, but Trump himself and the people who are most of his ardent supporters, do you think they're likely to stay within the GOP, or do you think that they don't have the staying power of the Goldwater rights? Well, that's, that's another interesting question. I mean, the thing about Goldwater was that he did reveal that moderates have a problem with grassroots organizing, right? And I remember asking this of Doug Bailey, who was one of Nelson Rockefeller's assistants and kind of invented a lot of the modern political consulting industry. And he said, well, you know, it's just harder for moderates to get grassroots supporters because moderates are moderate. The idea of picking up the sword of moderation and marching down a street uh, is just a, an antithetical concept. And the thing about moderates is that they often are not too certain that they're right. Uh, one of the quotes that all the guys, Bundy, Brewster, Richardson, loved to quote was from uh, Learned Hands, Spirit of Liberty. The spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. And you know, one of Bundy's friends was Isaiah Berlin, uh, the Oxford philosopher. And you know, at that time, it was believed that if you were absolutely certain about something, that you were flirting with totalitarianism. Uh, and Bailey's point was that, you know, if you actually have doubts, then that means you're not going to commit all of your time, resources, passion. You're not going to sacrifice your family and business life to see your ideological view prevail. Um, and this is a problem that, they, that, that moderates have wrestled with all along. So the Goldwater movement brought in people to the grassroots, excited them. A lot of the Goldwater people then turned around and voted for Eugene McCarthy in 1968. One of those people would be Hillary Clinton. Right? Uh, and again, it's because this is an anti-establishment revolutionary movement. And revolution especially excites the blood of young people who are more likely to participate in politics than it does people who are older and seen it and want to get reelected. And so, you know, the Goldwater people who got brought into politics, a lot of them, as you said, didn't become part of the establishment because once they were in office and they realized that they wanted to get reelected, there are certain things you have to do to do that. Um, and again, to draw an example from the last presidential campaign, you know, Rick Perry on paper looked like he was going to sweep the decks, right? Texas governor, you know, thoroughly conservative, didn't have, you know, Romney's compromised past. But then he gets up in, you know, one of these debates and is asked about the fact that as governor, he advocated uh, a program of giving in-state tuition to the children of illegal immigrants. And he's like, well, I'm from Texas. Hispanics are a very important part of our coalition. They're an important part of the state. You know, of course you're going to do this. He was booed off the stage, pretty much. Um, so again, if you actually want to be in politics, you have to do things that are not going to make you pure. You have to tarnish yourself, sully yourself with real world politics. Donald Trump has never done that. He's never been a politician. If he had been a politician, even I think in any minor degree, he'd probably be setting up to be president at this point. If he had pivoted, like I'm sure his advisors told him to pivot toward a more presidential posture after winning the Republican uh, nomination, he, he could have given Hillary a very good run for her money, I think. Um, will the people he brought into politics do that? I don't know, because the conservative movement in 1964 was not just in politics. It was also an intellectual movement with people like Bill Buckley, you know, exciting college audiences. Uh, there was Young Americans for Freedom, this kind of, you know, campus movement that was going on. Uh, there were people who genuinely were idealistic about the possibilities of conservative government, if that makes sense, even though there obviously is a contradiction in conservatism, which is that government is often enemy. And I'm not sure that the Trump people see that. I think a lot of Trump's most fervent supporters are people who are having a very hard time in this world. Uh, people who see that they've been left behind culturally, that neither party seems to care about them that much. Um, this is the section of America where, unlike every other ethnic group, the mortality rates are rising. Uh, people are dying deaths of despair, essentially. From suicide, alcoholism, drug overdoses. It's a big problem in Indiana, I know. Uh, and these are people who I don't think feel that there's even room for them in politics. They want all the bastards to get out, but I don't know if they actually want to invest the way the Goldwater people invested in the political process. I don't know that actually they believe in the political process on some level. Like I said, Brewster and his people were all part of the process school, whether they were exposed to it in law school or not. Um, George Bundy gave what is one of the most awesomely pretentious remarks to any reporter ever when he said, 
I believe in Heraclitus. Heraclitus being the Greek philosopher who said you could not step in the same river twice. But Heraclitus also being the philosopher of process. And Bundy, again, being someone who, when he was head of the Ford Foundation, would go around to radical students and say, it's okay that you're radical as long as you participate in the process. I just don't know that that's where the Trump supporters are coming from, so I actually see them having less of an impact long term. Thank you, Jeff. Laura, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand so I can put you on the, on the, the queue. So thank you for your talk. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. Um, so my question is sort of based on my understanding of moderate Republicans that currently exist. Uh -huh. And so my understanding of, of moderation in general is that there's sort of a bias towards the status quo or a bias towards an establishment that you talk about, which we know for a lot of, sort of marginalized groups, racial and ethnic minorities, women, the poor, is kind of a, an unjust or an unfair position. Um, and so my question coming from this talk is basically what societal good do you think moderation provides and what and why should we be striving for more moderate Republicans? Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, this is something that they struggle with in the RNC, right? They don't want to be demographically doomed as a party. Uh, and they don't want any minority group to perceive them as an existential threat because this is also what's driving the college-educated demographic away from the Republican Party, too. Um, but again, if you look at moderation, it doesn't mean that you can't be an ardent advocate of any particular cause. There, there again, is this idea of moderation that you don't believe in anything. And one of the things that actually inspired me to write this book was listening to Rush Limbaugh one day, when he was just kind of snorting brave moderates. Moderates, by definition, can't be brave because they don't have opinions. Great moderates in American history, show me that book. It's like, all right, well, I will. Um, and again, you know, moderates, you kind of think of someone who is, you know, just temperate, maybe doesn't really care that much, likes the status quo. But again, you get to the reality that the people driving civil rights through the government in the early 1960s were more often than not moderate Republicans. And one of the biggest players uh, in the civil rights movement on the government side was this guy called Bill McCulloch who represented this little town in Pequa, Ohio, who's a moderate Republican. Um, and he really fervently believed that America, to fulfill its true promise, had to give equal opportunities to black people. And that this to, to fail to do it was just to completely fail everything we stood for as a people. And you actually had a lot of you know, people around McCulloch being just as active, just involved, more involved, frankly, than the Democrats, who were more constrained by political thoughts. Like, how's this going to work for us in the next election? Um, so again, I don't think idealism is something that you can't do as a moderate. What it largely means is that you work through the system. And here again, you go back to Roger Baldwin, the head of the ACLU. I mean, he's both a radical and a conservative, right? He's a radical because he's standing up for the most marginalized people in society, communists uh, at that time. Um, the ACLU obviously is taking up a lot of very unpopular causes. But it's conservative because it's being done through the system. Right? And the idea being that no matter what your cause is, no matter how radical, no matter how much you'd like to see society transform, we're not revolutionary, right? In the sense that we don't think you actually want to take up arms to get this achieved. We want you to work through the process. But we do believe that anything can be done through the process. So moderation is idealistic in that sense. So I don't think anyone who has been you know, moved by the Black Lives Matter movement or anything else like that um, can't also be a moderate when it comes to politics, so long as they actually are working through the system. Thanks. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much for your talk. So as I heard you describe this history, I saw you put an enormous amount of narrative emphasis on individual powerful political actors who came at the right time and were able to sort of push the establishment uh, sort of um, off the radar temporarily, um, or I guess in this case permanently. but. I'm thinking about you know the institutions of presidential selection and changes to presidential selection from the 1960s onwards, specifically the advent of a dominant primary system. And I suppose there's a school of thought that would say, well, the reason why Donald Trump was nominated this year is that we have popular control of presidential nominations. And if we didn't have that, Trump never would have been nominated. John Kasich would have been nominated, or some moderate Republican would have been. So how, how much of this is uh, individual conservative ideologue political actors, and how much of it is just the institutions for selecting 
candidates, presidential candidates especially, have been democratized in a problematic way over the past 50 years? Yeah, I mean, one of the odd things about the way that moderate Republicans undercut themselves is that they were among the foremost advocates of moving to an all-primary system, right? Because that was open and transparent, and that's what government ought to be about. That's what good government Republicans ought to stand for, and the people should decide. Um, but the problem is that primaries are very low turnout contests. And in these contests, um, people who are united, who uh, have very distinct ideas about what ought to happen, can have a disproportionate impact. Uh, and again, this is why moderates at, were so disadvantaged, because not only did they have to face the Democrats in the general election, since they usually represented swing districts, but then they also had to face people coming at them from the right, which meant they had to raise twice as much money in practice. Um, and, you know, in a curious way, they were advantaged by the smoke-filled rooms of yesteryear, right, where the political professionals who wanted to win in the general election would pick someone who would have those characteristics. Um, and, you know, increasingly when you moved to a more open system, you got a small, unrepresentative group of people putting forward someone who had no chance at winning the general election, but gratified what they wanted to do. Uh, is there any way to put the genie back in the bottle, though? I kind of doubt it, to be honest. Uh, I think the reforms that people are talking about are not, you know, doing away with primaries as such. Um, I think it's more that they're talking about doing it away with gerrymandering which makes primaries not very important uh, for most people across the board. Um, I think they're actually talking about primarying from the center at this point, as you saw with uh, Tim Holzkamp in Kansas, you know, which is a big departure from past patterns. Um, so there's things you can do to make it less, make the system less vulnerable to an organized, disciplined minority, but I don't think you can actually do something as like getting away with, like moving away from open primaries anymore. You can go back towards having uh, non-popular election of senators. Thank you. Uh, I have a question in a way similar to Eric's in that uh, I'm curious about what actually explains the ascendancy of this radical faction of the Republican Party. So it was presented as as my as I interpreted as this battle of ideas and that for some reason that these ideas carried the day. But what about, you know, you mentioned a lot about political uh, uh, tactics, the uh, exigencies of winning office. So, how did these uh, this group of people go from the fringes to gaining electoral support and maybe electoral hegemony now in the in the party? I mean, that's obviously a big question, uh, and a lot of other people have tried to answer the question of why did conservatism succeed. I came out from the opposite side. Why did moderation fail? Um, so, it's kind of the same question, but it's not totally the same question. Um, and, you know, again, part of it was that moderates forgot about a lot of the nuts and bolts of politics that they were supposed to do. Uh, Cliff White, who was Barry Goldwater's campaign head during the primary part of the operation, wasn't really running uh, a grassroots operation so much as he was rounding up his colleagues from a particular faction of the Young Republican organization and getting them to take over uh, these poorly attended meetings. I mean, the reality about our democracy is it's a pretty low participation democracy, not just in terms of voting, but in terms of fulfilling all the other offices that are actually out there. You know, precinct captains, half of those offices go unfilled. Um, so anytime you actually get a movement that comes along that wants to seize power, um, they actually realize that they're kind of pushing against an open door, uh, just because people, generally speaking, don't care that much. And it doesn't take huge amounts of money either. Because again, if you looked at it, Back in 1960, it was the moderates who had all the money, you know, the wealthiest people. It was the moderates who had the organs, the, the, the organs of the media, something like you know the New York Herald Tribune. It was the moderates who had you know the popular politi politicians and the networks and all that sort of thing. But they allowed a lot of just the the, the regular low-level things to atrophy, again, just because that wasn't where their focus was. And I think, you know, one of the things about Cliff White was that he took as his model the Communist Party. You know, if you're a small ideological minority, but you want to have a big impact, there's things you can do to exploit the democratic process. You can all vote as a block, while everyone else, all your moderates, split their votes among different groups. You can keep going with orders of, you know, different procedural motions to keep the thing going all night, 
until the moderates have got disgusted and gone home to their spouses and their dog. And you, at 4.30 a.m., ram through everything you want to do. Uh, and you also are not constrained, if you're part of this organization, by tradition, by the norms that most people adhere to. You know, it wasn't considered a norm to insult your fellow Republican candidates for the presidency. Donald Trump did, and that was part of the jiu-jitsu he used to get ahead. So I think, again, it's, it's part of the process as it exists, and the way that disciplined minorities within that process can take advantage of what's presented to them. Okay. So I'm, I'm again thinking institutionally and just thinking about um, representative democracy and what it means uh, as opposed to what it's supposed to mean, uh, potentially. Uh, it's not supposed to mean mob rule or uh, it's, it's supposed to mean we elect people we respect to exercise their judgment on our behalf and are recall Burke's famous uh, letter to his constituents mm -hmm. saying, you know, you don't, you didn't send me here to do exactly what you want to be done. You sent me here to exercise my judgment. We seem to have lost that throughout the, the, the political system. And I'm wondering if it's a structural flaw, an inevitable flaw perhaps in a popular sovereign state. Uh, or if, I mean, it, it takes a certain, again, in contrast with the, the comments about, Rush Limbaugh's comments about, you know, what courage do moderates have, to stand up to your constituents. Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're right. Uh, I don't think a lot of politicians would stand up there and respond as Burke did to the electors of Bristol, you know, your representative owes you not his vote only, but his judgment. I, I mean, we kind of want that, but people don't want to tell people that either. Um, and part of what makes moderation difficult, uh, a virtue for, you know, only courageous, <laughs> only courageous minds, some would say, is just a lot of what people want is not what government should give them. Um, let me flip ahead a few people here. This is Bill Frenzel, not really well known. Um, he was a representative from Minnesota for 10 terms, uh, and then the end up at the Brookings Institution, which is where I crossed paths with him. He was very helpful to me in my work. But, you know, although everyone liked Bill because he was such a nice guy, um, he, the positions he stood for, everyone hated some part of them, right? Uh, and, and he always said, you know, the characteristic of the moderates is it means you get shot from all sides, right? So the Christian right didn't like him because he was moderately pro-choice. Um, and, you know, the liberals didn't like him because he was tight-fisted when it came to social spending. Uh, he didn't want to bail out New York City. He didn't want to bail out Chrysler. He didn't want bailouts of any kind whatsoever. Um, and that meant he got really bad you know, ratings from the, the consumers groups and the other liberal groups. Um, he didn't like agricultural subsidies, which put him up against um, Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms, for whom agricultural subsidies were very important to their state. He didn't like federally subsidized electric power, which put him up against Dick Cheney. You know, without federally subsidized electricity, Wyoming would be in a very bad way. Um, and he was against defense appropriations, right? In that sense, he was very much in the Eisenhower tradition. Eisenhower actually having cut defense spending by, I think it was 27%. You know, whereas Paul Ryan's budget, Paul Ryan has thought of this severe fiscal conservative, but he wouldn't cut a nickel from defense. Um, so essentially, you know, his whole point is that, you know, we have to get a handle on deficits. The fact that the deficit is $20 trillion is one of these very unpleasant facts we'd all prefer not to think about. Uh, and it's remarkable how little it has entered into the campaign rhetoric on either side this year. But that doesn't mean it's gone away, or even that it's necessarily manageable. It is a potential bomb under our feet, which may explode at some point. And the responsible thing to do, as numerous bipartisan commissions have said, is make sure that each side gives up something. Republicans are probably going to have to give on raising taxes. Democrats are probably going to have to give on some kinds of spending. It doesn't seem like there's any other way to square the circle, but no one wants that to happen, so we'll put it off. So yeah, uh, at some point, either our representatives are going to have to become a lot more unpopular and do the right thing, or we will all suffer the consequences. Okay. So it was really fascinating when we were talking about the kind of connection between moderation and this <clears throat> more faith in the political process and the importance of working with the political process. The associated. So I'm just curious if you can talk more about 
how, I mean, in this election, it seems like all the energy, you know, for example, with Bernie Sanders' campaign, and even maybe some of the populism with Donald Trump's is this, it's just the opposite of that, this feeling of the political process completely failing us, and with Citizens United and money in politics, and this kind of feeling of, you know, lack of faith or, or trust in the political process. And I'm just curious if that is, you know, what role that plays in this decline of moderation, if it is associated with working within the political system. Yeah, I mean, two good books that have been published relatively recently. One of them is by E.J. Dion called Where the Right Went Wrong. Um, and the point he makes over and over again is that conservatives ended up with Trump because they promised utopia to their followers. You know, if you just elect us, if you just expel the moderates from the party, then we will bring in the conservative golden age. And when it doesn't happen, because the majority of people don't want it, or it's not going to work, um, people get angry and they get cynical about the whole process. And cynicism is one of the major enemies of moderation. Uh, but George Bundy, when he was just out of, back, I guess, back from the war, uh, again, through his marvelous privileged connections, got to be the ghostwriter with Henry Stimson, uh, the former Secretary of State under both, well, Secretary of State and Secretary of War under both Republican and Democratic administrations, a hallmark of the establishment. In many ways, he was the, the founder and chairman of the establishment. And Simpson's, uh, Simpson's closing remark in that book was, you know, to the younger generation, it's like, you know, we've, we've failed about some things, but that doesn't mean that you can't try to do better than we have. Uh, the only deadly sin I know is cynicism. Um, and so again, it's this question about are people so, have they given up on American institutions? And is that is that cynicism justified? Uh, I don't know that it is, because Jane Mayer's book is a, all about, sort of, it's called dark money. It's all about money entering into the political process and distorting it in various ways. But in a way, it came out at a bad time because the big money hasn't had that much effect this year on the presidential race on the Republican side. I mean, Donald Trump got between two and three billion dollars worth of free media. Uh, and he hardly spent anything to the extent he has resources at all. We don't know, right? Um, but that meant that, you know, who, who didn't want Trump to be there? The Koch brothers didn't want him to be there. Sheldon Adelson didn't want him to be there. I mean, you can go down the list of big money donors you know, who had a big impact on the last presidential cycle, but have had a relatively minimal effect this time. So I don't say that Citizens United has not had a, a negative impact on the process. Uh, I don't even say that people are wrong to mistrust all of America's institutions, not just Congress, but banks, hospitals, churches, everything basically except the police and the military. Uh, I do say that it's going to be a potential problem if that's the only institutions that we really trust to settle our affairs in society. <laughs> further down the road. But I think ultimately, you know, this is maybe what the younger generation has an opportunity to do, to restore faith, to, to defeat cynicism uh, in all aspects of American life. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder uh, if you could speak to what you see as um, the role that the Democrat, Democratic Party platform plays in this fracturing of the Republican Party. It seems to me that moderation um, as an ideology uh, has to be defined in relationship to the opposition platform and um, how the Democratic Party platform over shifting over time has defined the fracturing within the Republican Party itself or if it hasn't really played a role. As you say. Well, I, I'm going to disagree with your premise because, again, this is part of what you hear on both the left and the right, which is that we need as different parties as possible. Right? And remember Barry Goldwater's campaign slogan, which Phyllis Schlafly made into her famous first book, is called A Choice, Not an Echo. And, you know, uh, essentially, both the left and the right have always criticized moderates for being not quite the real thing. Right? Um, so Barry Goldwater called, accused Eisenhower of running a, a dime store New Deal. Right? And uh, then the Democrats would accuse moderate Republicans of being a, a flint hearted imitation of real social concern. So there was a famous quote by Eugene McCarthy, which is that a moderate is someone who will see a woman drowning 30 feet offshore. He'll throw her a 20-foot rope and feel that he's gone more than halfway. Uh, and this is also why you know, Republicans get a lot of criticism 
they partake of both sides. Right? They understand both sides, they can see both sides, and this is why they're accused of being bisexuals, transsexuals, transvestites, hermaphrodites. Right? It's, it's a question, though, about whether you can actually overlap to some extent with the opposite side and still get things done. Now, I work in politics on the Republican side in Washington, so I see some of this which isn't really part of the narrative that we've got here. Uh, the moderates don't call themselves moderates in the Republican Party because they think that only means pro-choice Republicans, and there's hardly any of those left, that's true. But they call themselves governing Republicans because they actually do want to govern. And, you know, think to yourself, have you heard about some of the things that one or both members, houses of Congress, have passed in this last term? Uh, there was a major bill on opioids, right, to combat the epidemic. There was the uh, Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights Bill, proposed by a Republican. There was the first major reform of mental health care since John F. Kennedy's administration. There is the 21st Century Cures Act, which aims to put between two and three billion dollars a year additional into the National <coughs> Institutes of Health to find cures for Alzheimer's, diabetes, and cancer. You don't hear much about these because the media, although it's not biased in the way people think it is, loves conflict. Loves conflict. And unconsciously pushes this idea that the parties stand for opposite things and never come together, which then also naturally segues into the idea that they don't do anything and they're incapable of doing anything, which further feeds public cynicism. I question whether that's actually a reality. And I think part of what we need to get back to in moderation is the idea that you don't have to be as different as possible from the other side, that in fact there ought to be a lot of common ground uh, between the two parties so that things can get done. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I was wondering uh, if what you described, um, it's a cycle or it's a very long trend which um, will not be inversed until some kind of profound transformation will happen. Because I see the same thing, what you describe happens in Europe, I mean, we can see it not simply in the US, and I was wondering if it is something we should kind of fear or just wait until it passes. Um, I, I don't know, because again, you can see you know, some things that are similar to the Trump uh, phenomenon with the Brexit vote, with the Alternative for Deutschland, with the National Front, and you can kind of go down the list in your European countries. Um, and this suggests that it could be cyclical. It could be that people, over time, get tired with mainstream politics. Uh, it could be that mainstream politics have been, as accused, self-serving, self-dealing, that there needs to be some overturning of the elite. That's possible. Uh, the thing I worry about more is a book that came out this year uh, by an economist called Robert Gordon called The Rise and Fall of American Economic Growth, which posits that essentially there was the golden age between 1870 and 1970, when you had innovations coming online that really boosted productivity in a way that made a middle class lifestyle possible for people without, uh, a, a, without higher education, essentially. You could be a high school graduate, go to work at the local manufacturing plant and earn a good life and raise your children and achieve the American dream. And he says after 1970, that more or less ceases to be. And that's the reason why average wages for working people haven't risen since 1970. And that's why the future is going to be more of the same, uh, if not worse, because there just won't be jobs. Uh, and this is what's actually leading to the politics that we have now. Um, it's a very different kind of politics when you have a constantly rising uh, pie, to, to use George W's mixed economic metaphor, you know, if you can make the pie higher, that means you don't have to squabble as much. If it's a zero-sum game, then everyone else's benefits are coming at your expense, which means that you can't just say, yes, other groups in society are rising, and that's a good thing. Now, this is coming out of your pocket, uh, your children's pocket. If you don't believe that your children have the same prospects for the future as you do, you have a very different kind of politics. In moderation, the establishment, the status quo, none of these things sound good to you. Maybe the idea of just getting rid of all of it sounds good. But again, is that cyclical or is that long term? It depends on whether Gordon is right. It depends on whether the techno determinists, techno optimists kind of prevail in this contest. It depends on whether we can raise our growth rate. I don't know. We'll see. Thank you. Any last questions? I have a question. And this question dovetails with, with the, the answer you gave there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times columnist Roger Cohen was here and gave an interesting talk about Trump.
and the media, uh, vis a vis the media especially. And so one of the major issues, which is what we all know and can see, is this, what he termed, the tribalization of the media. So if you like conspiracy theories, you read whatever. If you like, uh, you know, so the, the issue, the, the, you know, the news that's fit to print and papers of repute no longer have pride of place in, in where Americans get their news. And so it seems uh, that one of the issues is, so you said, here's a theory about uh, the economic situation in the United States, but that, so the, the diagnosis of the problem there is something that people aren't getting from the media. And so you can get your flavor of the day and uh, politics in many ways then becomes post-factual, as we see with someone like Donald Trump. And so it would seem that, and this is something which has not been new, Walter Littman wrote about this almost 100 years ago, omnicompetence. Uh, and so how could we, it seems that we could never solve this problem of the insurgent, the ascendancy of this insurgent radical element in the Republican Party if people can no longer even have any common ground with which to have a discussion. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a big worry, right? Always has been, uh, you know, if, if the facts cannot be trusted, you can't start with the basis of facts, how do you actually have any kind of rational discussion? This is why a lot of people are sending around Voltaire's quote, right? The, the leader who can make you believe impossibilities can make you commit atrocities. Uh, it's definitely something to be worried about. Um, I don't know the way back, to be honest, because it's hard, again, to put the internet back in the bottle. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why Congress lost its ability to come together uh, and, and reason is that the members of Congress don't really know each other nowadays. Uh, and to some extent, Dick Luger's defeat has to do with that, right? He had a home in DC, which everyone used to do, um, but then he was sort of criticized for being not a real Indianan. He'd gone Washington, he'd gone Bellway because he wasn't back here every weekend. So after he lost, you can bet that all the politicians are back in their home districts. Uh, and they really are only in Congress from Tuesdays through Thursdays. Hardly anyone's around on Monday or Friday. Um, and they don't know each other anymore the way they used to. Uh, and their spouses and their children don't grow up together. And it's much easier to demonize someone who you don't know personally. Uh, and you know, what we're seeing in Washington is sort of writ large across the country. You must have heard of the big sort, right? People not only get their news from places from people who agree with them, but they live in places where everyone else around them agrees with them. Um, it's segregation by class, it's segregation by income, it's segregation by ideology. It goes across the map. Uh, again, I don't know how to put that genie back in the bottle. I don't know how we come together. Uh, I do think at this point, you know, most parties contain a core of people who do believe in common facts. Uh, and this is what allows us to stick together. But again, this is moderation, right? Moderation is part of what allows that. Allows this very diverse, sprawling, continental-sized country to hold together. And therefore, it's something that has to be defended. Uh, I know how we, you bring this situation back. We invite people like you to teach <laughs> us uh, uh, something about this virtue that is both difficult but necessary for us today. So. Uh, thanks for uh, taking time to, to come here, talk to us about an important topic, and, and uh, let's give a, a big round of applause. And there's one table at 4 o'clock here featuring.